All right, we're going to get started with our presentation today. Uh, my name is Kate Reed. I'm seeing lots of folks uh, who are participants that I know. So welcome to those that I've met before and also welcome to those who I've not met before. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, I am the uh, co-chair along with Candace Gomez in our Garden City office of our school law practice group here at Bond. And uh, we thought it would be helpful, Candace and I, just to do a brief update today on some of the significant changes that are occurring with the open meetings law um, that are part of the state's recent budget bill. Uh, it, there has been a lot of confusion, I think, just because of the COVID provisions for open meetings law, um, and then also understanding how those provisions play with the longstanding provisions for virtual meetings. Um, and now additional changes with the budget bill. So we thought it would be helpful to have a brief seminar just to go over um, what's on the horizon, timelines for compliance, et cetera. So I don't expect today's session will be um, lengthy. I'm hoping to get everybody out by about 2.30, but also happy to stay on the line if anyone has any questions. Next slide, please. So let's do a brief recap just of how we got to where we are today. Um, and the rules for open meetings law and particularly virtual meetings, which is the topic of today's presentation. So prior to March 2020, virtual meetings were only authorized under very strict conditions, which most of you uh, are familiar with and probably because of the strictness of those conditions did not actually utilize virtual meetings very often. Um, but, but essentially pre-March 2020 or pre-pandemic, virtual meetings were only authorized if there was notice to the public of the location of the virtual participant, and also if the location of the virtual participant was accessible to the public. So what that means is that if you had a board member who was in Honolulu and wanted to log into the meeting virtually, their location would have to be accessible to the public. And also that um, hotel location, for instance, would have to be noted in, uh, in the meeting notice. Because of how absurd those provisions were, very few boards that I work with at least took advantage of that provision. Uh, one of the other requirements as well was that only videographic participation was permitted, so no telephonic participation. So then fast forward to March 2020, um, at the very outset of the pandemic, I believe it was March 5th, March 6th time period of 2020, uh, the governor at the time, then Governor Cuomo, uh, passed an executive order that authorized remote meetings during the COVID-19 pandemic under certain relaxed conditions. And these are the requirements that have been in place on and off with some breaks, which I'll get to later, um, but generally available on and off since March 2020. Videographic or telephonic participation was permitted. Meetings needed to be transcribed. So this is as in addition to the requirement of keeping minutes, which uh, previously only required notation of the actions actually taken during the meeting. Uh, transcription means a word for word transcript of exactly what was um, what transpired during the meeting. And then also that the meetings were recorded and available to the public. Next slide, please. So there was a brief period of time during the summer of 2021 when the uh, Cuomo administration was transitioning to the Hochul administration where the state of emergency was temporarily lifted. And we actually had a reversion to the original rules where the only authorized remote meetings were those meetings that complied with the original videographic participation rules. So that was the, again, going back to my example of your board member who's in Honolulu, uh, could participate videographically as long as the Honolulu location was accessible to the public and also the location was noted on the meeting notice. Uh, now in September through October, or rather through April of this year, there's actually been an amendment in place from the legislature that amended the open meetings law to provide for virtual participation during the declared state of emergency. So in other words, the legislation continued that, ability, that, that authority for virtual participation in meetings, provided that uh, the governor had a corresponding state of emergency. Once the state of emergency is lifted, that authority for virtual meetings would terminate at the same time. So the most recent extension of the state of emergency extended that authority for virtual meetings through April 15th, um, which as we all know, just passed, hence uh, the impetus for today's webinar. Next slide, please. So that brings us to last week on April 8th, uh, we had the 2020 budget bill that passed through the legislature. And the budget bill contains provisions that uh, modify how virtual participation in meetings will proceed into the future. So this is the heart of the presentation and what I wanted to make sure everybody was aware of these developments. So from April 8th 
through June 8th of this year, so period of two months, boards are permitted to allow virtual participation under the traditional COVID rules. That would be in addition to the original rules that existed pre-COVID for you know, the, the Honolulu board member participation. But um, so provided there's transcription, recording uh, of the meeting, participation virtually may continue through June 8th, and that can be either videographic or telephonic. Now, the big change is that effective June 8th, 2022 through July 1st, 2024, so for a two-year period of time, there are going to only be two options for board members to participate virtually in board meetings. So that's an important date to calendar, which is that June 8th, 2022, because that's when the rules we've been operating under for the last two years during the pandemic will no longer be in place. And these new rules that we're going to cover on the next couple of slides uh, will be taking over. Next slide, please. So option number one is pretty easy to understand. It's the traditional so-called rules for virtual participation. So this is going back to the Honolulu example, video conferencing only, board members able to participate virtually if the public is allowed to attend in person where that board member happens to be located. Uh, that's the one that's usually the one that makes board members not interested in pursuing this, um, this course of virtual participation because it's somewhat inconvenient, but then also notice of the remote board members location provided in the meeting notice. So those are the, tr the traditional pre-COVID rules and the budget bill is clear that although there's now an additional option, which I'm going to get to in a few moments, the original traditional rules for virtual participation are still permitted. Um, but we also have an option two, which is a little bit more complicated, which we'll get to on the next slide. Next slide, please, Kathy. So we off, often, we all also now, beginning on June 8th, will have uh, an additional method for participation. So I'm calling this option number two. Again, this will be in place from June 8th, 2022 through July 1st, 2024. And then time will tell whether the state uh, believes that this is a good option for participation and ultimately extends that option. But under option two, there are new remote participation rules. So boards of education, um, and if there are individuals, I should clarify as well, that are not our school clients on this call, this would apply to any public agency in New York State as well. Um, but boards of education may use video conferencing, so not telephonic, just video conferencing, without in-person attendance at the location of the member participating by video conference provided certain additional criteria are satisfied. So again, I wanna be perfectly clear, this is in addition to the traditional rules. The traditional rules still apply, but in addition to those rules, we can, we, we can allow videographic remote participation by a board member if all of the following conditions are satisfied, and there's many of them. And before everybody starts jotting down notes, also please note that uh, these presentation materials will be available for all of our Bond School clients after the webinar. And I do believe that Kathy is recording this as well. So um, if you have administrators or board members that would like this information and were unable to participate today, you're welcome to send them to our website or put them in touch with Kathy who can get them a copy of the presentation. Um, so don't, don't feel you have to scribble down notes. Next slide, please. So these are our new criteria that need to be satisfied for remote meeting participation under option two. So uh, the first rule is that there has to be at least one physical location where members of the public are attending in person. So the easiest way to think about this is that this is essentially requiring under option two that all meetings are hybrid. There has to be uh, in-person attendance by the public. And then in addition, this goes along with number two, a quorum of the board must be physically present at the physical location. So there must be a quorum of the board convened in person for that meeting where the public can participate in person. And then certain members may participate virtually under these rules, provided there is a quorum physically convened. So in order to allow certain members to participate virtually, first of all, the board must pass a resolution that allows for the use of video conferencing under these rules. So of course, um, I or any bond school attorney that you work with regularly can help you with preparing a resolution if you'd like to uh, take advantage of this option after June 8th. Um, and also board member participation by video conference is only going to be allowed 
if the board member is unable to physically attend because of extraordinary circumstances. And you can see the definition of extraordinary circumstances is fairly, fairly broad. So we have disability, illness, caregiving responsibilities, and here's the um, kind of catch-all, if you will, any other significant or unexpected factor or event which precludes physical attendance. Um, and then the law states that those need to be defined with some degree of particularity in your policy and procedures, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, but you can see there's any manner of, of uh, excuses that would qualify for a board member to be able to participate remotely under these extraordinary circumstances. What is different though, is that under the COVID rules, a board member didn't have to have an excuse for participating remotely. And that indeed continues to be the case through June 8th of this year. Any board member can participate remotely. Also, the whole board can participate remotely. No need for uh, anyone to physically be present through June 8th. After June 8th, again, through July, 2024, a physical quorum of the board needs to be pres present at the location where members of the public are in attendance. Next slide, please. So in addition to the requirements I just went over, there's some others as well. Members who are participating by video conference must be able to be heard, seen, and identified at all times except exec session. So I'm sure um, if you're like me, you've participated in a lot of virtual meetings during the pandemic, and you may have seen several meetings uh, where you know there would be sometimes a commotion in the background, and a board member's screen would then go to uh, you know uh, the the video would be turned off or the audio would be turned off, um, and and that was pretty routine I think during the pandemic as people were dealing with childcare concerns and um, you know family concerns and everything else. So now under this new uh, budget bill, in order for participation by video conference to be permitted again, there needs to be that excuse. Uh, for excused absence, essentially, but also the member needs to be mindful of keeping their video on at all times and uh, so that they can actually be seen. And obviously that would not be the case during executive session. The public would not have the right to observe that board member during executive session. Uh, the next requirement is the public needs to be allowed to participate via video conference in real time and in the same capacity as those who attend in person. So just out of necessity and, um, you know, kind of dealing with things as they came down during the pandemic, uh, many boards said, listen, it's difficult to manage uh, video participation during public comment. So if you want to submit something in writing, for instance, we'll read it during public comment. But if you want to participate in public comment, you need to show up in person. Those rules are arguably no longer permitted under this, uh, under this option too, so to speak, because the law does state that in order for uh, the this virtual participation to occur, the public also has to have the ability to participate uh, via video conference in real time and in the same capacity. So that would mean if um, people in person can get up and speak during the meeting, during public comment, the board would have to come up with some provision for that to happen uh, via via remote means as well. So maybe that's by live streaming in somebody who's remote. Uh, maybe it's by giving them temporarily the ability to speak. Um, in a Zoom format, whatever uh, format your board happens to use. And then finally, this one's pretty easy, and most board members have been doing this already through the pandemic, but the minutes also must reflect which members were in person and which were participating vi uh, videographically. Next slide, Kathy. Additionally, if you're going to be using video conferencing, that needs to be indicated in your public notice of the meeting. Again, not a, not a you know not a heavy lift. I think most of you have been doing that throughout the pandemic. In any case, uh, the video conferenced meeting must be recorded, and the recorded recording needs to be posted on the uh, public body's website within five days of the meeting. Uh, this is distinguished from the minutes, which can be prepared up to two weeks and made available. There's a quicker turnaround time now with the video conferencing um, and, and the recording of the video. Technology used to video conference must be ADA compliant, um, meaning, for instance, if you are uh, doing a video format or live streaming it via video format, uh, you must provide for closed captioning and any other ADA um, compliance issues. So uh, that would be something that I would encourage all of you to work with your IT directors to make sure that uh, they're utilizing an ADA checklist for any video conferencing technology that's utilized to make sure that any format you're using uh, is not going to give rise to any kind of ADA liability for your district. Next slide, please. 
So now the other requirement here is that it's important to note that this option two with all these additional requirements does not apply during any national state or locally declared state of emergency if the public body determines that the circumstances necessitating the emergency declaration would affect or impair the ability of the public body to hold an in-person meeting. So that's very wordy, but basically what this means is the, the legislature's hope that holding open the possibility, as we've seen in the last two years, that the governor has these emergency powers and as, as do many uh, you know, members of the federal government as well and local governments. So any national state or locally declined, uh, declared state of emergency would trump these rules essentially. And provided that state of emergency in the judgment of the public body will impair the ability of public participation, then the, the, the uh, district would still have the option of going to a remote format if that is authorized. So um, all to say, I'm not exactly sure how this is gonna work out and how it's going to play with any other future declared states of emergency. So just be aware that this is out there. We would obviously look to provide you with additional targeted guidance in the event that there is a future state of emergency declared during uh, this period of June 8th, 2022 through July 1st, 2024, um, to make sure that we understand how that interplays with uh, these provisions for virtual meetings. But I think what the legislature was trying to do here was to keep open the possibility that we could revert to the COVID rules, so to speak, where all that's required is transcription and recording. If in the judgment of the governor or your state department or your local department of health, for instance, uh, that there's a pandemic or something else that impacts the ability of, for people to safely gather, as we've seen uh, those circumstances do come up uh, and have come up during the last two years. Uh, next slide, please. So that would be uh, all of our prepared presentations today on the changes in the new budget bill to the uh, virtual participation per the open meetings law. Um, I'm very happy to answer any other questions that anyone has. So I'm going to stay online for a little while and monitor the chat and anyone who wants to stay and uh, listen or participate is welcome to do so. The first question that we have in the chat states, are board committee meetings also governed under these revised open meetings laws? And the answer is yes. Um, the reason for that is because the open meetings law defines a open, uh, extends the definition of a, an open meeting to any meeting of a committee of the board. Uh, the reason for that being that a committee of the board is actually included within the definition of a public agency under the open meetings law. So whether these rules apply depends on whether uh, the, meet, the committee is in fact a board committee. Uh, and there is some sophistication in the rules around committees, but generally speaking, if you have a committee or subcommittee of the body, uh, meaning a board finance committee, uh, a, uh, a board policy committee, for instance, those committees which consist of board members are themselves public bodies that are subject to the open meetings law. And any body that is subject to the open meetings law after June uh, 2022 will be able to take advantage of these virtual meetings provisions and will have to comply with them if they wish to take advantage of that. Um, Additionally, somebody has asked how long do the recordings of the meetings need to be posted on the school website? Uh, that's a great question. I'm not prepared to answer that one on the air just because the answer to that question is likely going to uh, lie in the LG1, uh, LGS1 records retention schedule for school districts and municipalities. And I'm not sure if that schedule has been updated to reflect uh, virtual meetings or any of the considerations that we're talking about today. So I would just say, uh, feel free to shoot me that question um, outside of this format, just to jog my memory. And I will certainly follow up with you on that after I've had a chance to check the LGS one. I don't, I don't uh, want to pretend to have the answer to that one on the spot. Somebody else asked, is the recording which must be posted only a video recording or is an audio recording permissible? I read the law as requiring that uh, the actual video recording be available because again, this new development states that only uh, tele, only videographic participation is permitted, not just audio. Um, so I would err on the side of including the video recording on your website, not just an audio recording of the audio portion. Uh, the second, the next question that came up, which is also a good one, relates to committees. If fewer than one half of the board members are present at a committee meeting, does the open meetings law kick in? The answer is yes if that committee is indeed a committee of the board. Um, so in other words, if all of the members of that subcommittee are board members, even if 
uh, even if there is not a quorum of the whole board that's present for that committee, if there's two or more board members and they're doing the work of the board, uh, then that meeting would be a meeting subject to the open meetings law. There are other uh, opinions of the committee in on open government and case law that states that sometimes even when that committee contains additional non-board member participants, even those committee meetings can be member uh, meetings of the board subject to the open meetings law if the committee is deemed to be doing the work of the board. So that gets a little bit more hyper-technical. I'm ha happy to answer those questions offline. But generally speaking, the answer to this question is yes. Even if less than a quorum is present for a committee meeting, uh, if, those, if that committee is doing the work of the board and the board and, and the committee consists of board members, then that is a meeting that's going to be subject to the open meetings law and where all of these uh, virtual meetings provisions could work. Somebody also said for the resolution, can the board approve one resolution that extends from 6822 to 7124, or is a resolution needed each time the hybrid option is exercised? That's a great question. I construe the new law as requiring that the board adopt a resolution authorizing this method uh, of participation and not that you have a resolution each and every time this situation comes up. The resolution would there uh, would be in place and then there would be corresponding procedures and policy that would go along with that resolution that would then come into play every time a board member wishes to take advantage of these provisions. So what we are envisioning is that we would have a resolution that would be uh, adopted during the reorg meeting. Um, if this extends beyond 2020, you know, if the board wishes to extend this beyond 2023, we would recommend that you re-up it. Uh, at the next reorg meeting, just as you do with many of your standing resolutions, because just as a reminder, one board lacks the authority to bind a successor board to any kind of course of action. You always want to re up, uh, uh, you know, re up those resolutions each year at your reorg process. But generally speaking, one resolution would be needed uh, for each board of education to authorize that option. And then we would also recommend corresponding policies and procedures um, that go along with that. The next question relates also to committees, I believe. And the question is, what if they are advisory boards? Um, there is some case law, I believe this question is, is getting at the concept that there is case law that stands for the proposition that if there is a committee that is that does not consist of board members, that consists of non-board members that are merely making uh, advisory recommendations to the board, uh, that are non-final and that the board ultimately has to accept or reject. So an example of that, for instance, would be uh, maybe the district puts together a parent advisory council, uh, PTA advisory council, something like that. Those would not be subject to open meetings law. However, certain advisory boards are always subject to open meetings law, so tread carefully. Um, one of them is shared decision making. So all of you likely in compliance with the regulations still have a shared decision making committee that engages in your shared decision making activities. All of those committees are still subject to open meetings law. Uh, the next question is, if two or more board members are meeting in person, doing work of a board, must the committee take questions from the public, or may the public be limited to attend, observe, listen? Um, now, this is a great question. There's uh, several, I think, questions embedded in this. So if two or more board members are meeting in person, that is not necessarily subject to the open meetings law. Again, in order for a meeting to occur, board business has to be happening and there needs to be a quorum. So the quorum can be a quorum of the whole board or it could be a quorum of a designated committee. So let's say you have a school board of, uh, um, uh, with per participation of nine members. Um, if you have nine members, you have a quorum of five that's required to meet a quorum. Let's say uh, your district then also forms a policy committee that consists of five members. In order for a quorum to exist, three of those five members of the policy committee would need to be present discussing policy together in order to trigger the open meetings law. Similarly, if we're talking about the board as a whole, five of the nine members would have to be gathered in order to trigger open meetings law. So this is why we often say, and when I lecture on this topic, I, I often say chance encounters between two board members at the grocery store 
typically not going to trigger open meetings law. One board member calling another board member to say, geez, can you believe we're voting on blah, blah, blah? Um, you know, maybe in poor taste, maybe, maybe not the best communication style, uh, but typically not sufficient to trigger the open meetings law because you're not going to have, uh, you don't have a quorum in that situation. You just have two board members interacting. So I want to clarify that piece in this question. The other question though relates to uh, the, the ability of the public to attend, observe, listen, or even ask questions or uh, demand answers, in other words, from, from the board, as I understand the, the question. And that's also a great question. So there is nothing in the open meetings law that requires that the public have the opportunity to actually engage in public comment during a meeting. Most boards, because they are accountable to their taxpayers, uh, publicly elected, you know, have public scrutiny of their actions, have adopted policies that permit participation by the public in board meetings through a designated public comment period. But it's important to recognize that that's a matter of policy. It's not a requirement of the open meetings law. So whenever we're talking about public participation in board meetings, we're talking about policy. We're not talking about open meetings law compliance uh, per se. So that's an important distinction as well. The case law has generally said that the public does not have a right, to, despite the fact that we often characterize open meetings law as a public participation law, it actually isn't. It's a public observation law. It allows the public to observe the goings on and the, and the doings of the school district, but not to actually participate in the meeting. Public has the right to observe, not to participate. That's the key distinction. And so a board certainly can have a policy that states that uh, there is no public comment at all, as long as that policy is applied equally to all members of the public, regardless of their viewpoint or their perspective, that is legal. It may not be politically sound, may not be a great uh, way to you know, develop uh, you know, transparency with your public, but it is legal. Uh, the other question is, must the committee take questions from the public? Many boards have policies that state that if they will entertain public comment, the comment is it's one directional only. The public can share their views, but the board does not necessarily respond to any of the public comment. Uh, in my experience, boards utilize that very uh, unevenly when they have those policies, often, uh, you know, some meetings they will respond. Sometimes the superintendent will say, well, I'll address some of the questions during my report or during a response. It's important that you try to be uniform in the way you handle public comment. And it's important that whatever policy you have on public comment actually reflect your practice. So you're not deviating from that practice. That's, that's the best advice I can give in this respect. But generally speaking, uh, whether you allow the public to participate in public comment uh, whether you entertain their questions and actually respond to their questions, whether they're limited to observation versus actually, uh, you know, lodging questions is entirely a function of your board's policy and not dictated by state law. Uh, and I am not, it looks like that's the last question that we had. I'm going to stick around for just another minute or two here uh, in case anybody else has anything to ask, whether about open meetings law in general or virtual participation, uh, it's your you know half hour to chat with a lawyer. So happy to answer anything about open meetings law while I'm on the air here. Somebody just asked, can you please review executive session topics and when it is appropriate to be in executive session? That is a very broad topic. Um, I, I will talk just generally about executive session in general. The, um, the, the executive session topics are outlined in the open meetings law. Most of them do not apply to school board operations. Uh, they are more functional, for instance, in municipal and uh, municipal contexts where you have, for instance, law enforcement investigations and complaints, um, and they're not going to be applicable to school districts. But there are several executive session bases that come up regularly in school districts, which I'll touch on briefly. Um, one of them is the so-called personnel exception for executive session, which is not actually the personnel exception because it's very uh, it's very narrow, but it applies whenever the board is essentially talking about any particular person um, in the school district, whether that is a, a matter leading to the appointment of that person, the demotion, discipline, 
transfer, et cetera, of that person. When you're talking about a particular person and therefore a particular person's privacy is implicated, uh, the board is able to make a motion to enter into an executive session to discuss that person. I, I raise that just because I would say that that is one of the most commonly misused uh, and misunderstood provisions for executive session. Uh, many boards operate as though there is a general personnel exception. And I'll illustrate this with an example, which would be, you know, if the superintendent wants to share a new organizational chart and share uh, that there's going to be a new supervisory structure, for instance, there's going to be a new elementary uh, education assistant superintendent who's going to be overseeing curriculum and teaching and learning, uh, and there's going to be somebody else overseeing professional development. Those are structural discussions that don't have anything to do with particular people. And if you're not talking about a particular person, chances are that topic is one that really should be occurring in an open session and not in an executive session. Um, so I would say that's the most commonly misapplied and misunderstood provision. Um, we've also uh, defended districts in litigation related to the litigation exception. So um, all of you on the, on the call are probably aware that it is permissible for boards to enter executive session to discuss litigation related topics, but it is important that your resolution be very specific when you enter executive session in order to utilize this provision. Um, and mainly what the courts have generally said is you have to actually identify um, the threatened or pending litigation that you're discussing in order for that resolution to not be at risk of being declared null and void. Um, so that means if you have the case of Joe versus uh, you know, the Board of Education that's pending in state Supreme Court. If you're entering executive session to discuss that particular litigation, uh, the resolution shouldn't just say resolve to enter executive session to discuss pending litigation. It really is supposed to say resolve to enter executive session to discuss the case of Joe versus Board of Education index number, blah, blah, blah. Um, so in, in my experience, that's another way that uh, you know, that, that the mechanics of the executive session are not always handled appropriately, and uh, some care is due for it and, and, and necessary for that because we have seen a rise in litigation related to improprieties with the motions for entry into an executive session. Um, executive session is a topic that really we could have spent an entire presentation just on that topic, so I'm going to move on, but if the, uh, if the participant who, who asked that question has any further questions about that, I'm happy to answer those offline as well. Uh, somebody also asked, can we make a new policy for committee meetings different from full board meetings? Um, I'm not exactly sure what, what this question is inquiring about, but I think, um, I think what is being asked here is, can there be different rules for committee meetings versus full board meetings in terms of public comment, perhaps? Um, the answer to that is yes. Boards control the, uh, uh, their committee process via, uh, via their own policy process. And that's, there's you know, commissioner's law that, that's been pretty clear on that point. So boards can determine uh, how their committees are constructed by policy. They can just determine who the participants are going to be, uh, who, you know, what the work of the committees will be, who can participate in the committees, who gets to, you know, what public comment consists of. All of that can be different for committee meetings than full board meetings. The only requirement is that if it's a committee of the board, uh, again, that open meetings law is the floor of requirements that need to be satisfied. In other words, it still needs to be publicly posted. Quorum needs to be present for work to be done. Uh, quorum of the committee, I should say, uh, the public needs to be able to observe the goings on of the operations and minutes need to be kept of any formal action taken. So uh, there still is that requirement that you comply with open meetings law. But aside from that, yes, uh, you can certainly adopt policy at the local level that provides for different provisions for committee meetings versus full board meetings. Uh, somebody inquired, and I think this is going back to the point about litigation. What if the lawsuit has been threatened but not yet filed? Uh, which is a great question. So I think what this means is what if uh, there's a threatened lawsuit that the board wants to discuss that hasn't yet been put into suit? What would a resolution look like in that case? It can be more vague and the courts are going to be more respectful of the board being more vague under those circumstances. So in that case, you wouldn't list the lawsuit because it is not public yet. It's not in suit. Maybe it's only threatened. Uh, you can be more general. So for instance, if it's a threatened uh, action by, a, by the union, uh, you can reference that. You can say to enter motion to enter executive session to discuss threatened litigation by 
a collective bargaining unit in the district. In other words, you don't have to identify the particular bargaining unit. Um, if it's a particular staff member that you believe is going to sue the district, you can say to discuss pending litigation or a rather threatened litigation by a staff member against the district, by a, a parent against the district, by a student with a disability, et cetera. Um, so that's typically what I do. I generalize the description uh, of, of uh, you know, this, this um, you know, you, you, you do a general description of the action that's going to be taken and the threatened litigation that you're anticipating without giving away any specific details about those, um, those individuals. So I think uh, I'm not seeing any further questions about open meetings law today. So it's been a real pleasure speaking with all of you about the developments in the budget bill today. Uh, Terrific act, um, being able to engage with all of you and answer some of your questions about open meetings law. Seems like maybe uh, our feedback and our takeaway from this is that it would be helpful to do a general presentation again on executive session and open meetings law gen generally as well. Uh, so would be happy to uh, do that again in the future as well. So thank you everybody and have a wonderful day and a wonderful week.